Our speaker this afternoon is Bruce Stulting. Of course, he spoke to us this morning. Did a very good job on dishonesty. Uh, and since this morning, he's done nothing notable. <clears throat> He is still married to Sue Stilton and still have three children, still have just three children. So really not much has changed. <laughs> but uh, I will say this, that we, we here at Spring consider him a, a dear friend and very privileged to know him. And we consider the uh, all the brethren at Fesh Hatcher Road a blessing to be able to have uh, sweet fellowship with them from time to time, so we're very pleased with that. And Bruce uh, is a very knowledgeable person and is able to uh, impart that knowledge in a way that each of us who is not yet asleep <laughs> will be able to get that knowledge. He's going to speak to us on a very important topic these days, uh, divorce and remarriage. Bruce can speak to us. If I'd have known that, I'd have phoned it in. That's <laughs> still time. Then, it, that, then I got to thinking, and I said, you know, I remember a cartoon I saw somewhere, and it was a, a college classroom, and uh, the students showed up, and the professor was gone that day, and so he had a tape recorder up on the desk, and it was just playing the tape, and they could take notes. The next day, uh, the next frame of the cartoon, all the students were there taking notes from the recorder. Then the next frame, there was the recorder, and then where the desks were for the students, they all had recorders. So I guess if we did it that way, I could have phoned it in, and you all could have had your tape recorders and just had the uh, spring congregation mail them to you. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, you know, uh, I'm telling you, it's pretty hard to follow the last lesson. I mean, he did an excellent job. We've had some great preaching today. And uh, I'm, I'm with Buddy. He talks about these young men. Uh, I am just, and I was going to say this anyway, but Buddy beat me to it. Uh, we can't say enough about our young men and the need for our young men to really step up and start taking a leadership role in the Lord's church and, and uh, as elders and preachers and and just older members in general, we need to look for those young men that have that potential and help them develop it because we are in desperate need of uh, men to take the leadership of the church both now and in the future. And I, I'm really glad to see these young men not only willing to do it, but doing it very well, getting up here and presenting the gospel and talk about these uh, important subjects, not afraid to speak the truth. So, uh, I am on camera. Well, that's going to be a wander around. Okay, I'll try to stay right here in the lineup. I got you. All right, so we good? Okay. All right. Marriage, divorce, remarriage. There's not been a time in history that God has not had a plan for the home, marriage in particular. Uh, the last lesson we talked about God's plan for marriage and uh, that even in the beginning, you know, God created Adam and it was not good for Adam to be alone. And in the process of uh, solving that problem, that issue, God allows all the animals to pass before Adam and he names them. And whatever Adam named those animals, that's what they were called. And after that was done, it was found that there was no helper suitable for Adam. You know, dog may be man's best friend, but dog is not a suitable helper for a man. And when God decides to supply Adam with a suitable helper, He didn't make another man. He didn't say, choose from among the animals which one you want to be your helper. He made woman. That was the helper 
that was suitable for man. And it's been that way ever since. That's the way God intended it. And in fact, when we think about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, uh, let me see if this thing's going to work. There we go. Marriage, divorce, remarriage. I want to look at two primary verses uh, in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 19, uh, beginning, of course, in verse 1, it says, It came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, He departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed Him, and He healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Again, a loaded question. It it says right out they're tempting him. Uh, And so we're suspicious. But it's interesting to notice how Jesus answered. Jesus answered the sinner of them, Have you not read? Imagine that. Imagine, you know, as many people that have problems with marriage, divorce, and remarriage, how many of them actually go to the Bible and consider what the Bible has to say about it? We live in a culture, as we've discussed since last night, that man wants to have it his way, and he's going to have it his way. And he doesn't really care what God has to say about it. But those that are honest, those that are seeking the truth, those that are really interested in the correct answer will go to the Bible because that's the source. And so Jesus says, Have you not read that He which made them at the beginning... Now see, that's, that, that's the back of the beginning that we were talking about in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 when God created man and then for man created woman. And then that union took place, and we have the first marriage on uh, record. He made them male and female. Notice that. We think about eligibility to marry. It has to be between a man and a woman. That's the way it was in the beginning. That's the way God intended for it to be. And if marriage is going to please God, it has to be between a man and a woman. The problem is that our culture and our society has grown calloused to the moral implications of homosexual relationships and is now promoting a thing that is an abomination in the eyes of God. And that would be the union of a man with a man and a woman with a woman in what they consider matrimony. Well, the Bible doesn't speak of anything like that. Again, if you want to know the truth, go back to the Bible Read what it says in the beginning. He that made them, made them male and female. And said, for this cause. Notice, for this cause. Because the man was made for the woman. For that cause. A man shall leave father and mother. And shall cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. Let's stop right there for just a minute. There's a big controversy even in the Lord's church over what it means to be one flesh. And I think that last hour Mark did a great job discussing that. You know, some people say that, that one flesh is really the act of a sexual relationship. When the marriage is consummated, then they become one flesh. Well, if that's the case, if that constitutes marriage, then you would have to commit fornication before marriage actually exists. That would then constitute uh, marriage. And by the way, what happens, we talked about this earlier today, somebody mentioned it, about dress, right? Didn't Andy talk about the, the time in the Old Testament when the woman dressed up as a prostitute? Well, what happens if a man has relationships with a sexual relationship with a prostitute? Does that constitute marriage? You see, that's the dilemma that you get into when you say one flesh. And I think another thing that we need to consider is how this same uh, phrase is used in Ephesians chapter 5. We think about Ephesians chapter 5, Paul uses the relationship between a husband and a wife to describe the relationship between Christ and the church. He says, beginning in verse 
27, that, uh, that he might present unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought man to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. See, there's that word. No man ever uh, hated his own flesh, but what? Nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. For we, talking about the church, are members of one body, of his flesh. And of his bones. For this cause, now notice, shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, he says, when I speak concerning Christ and the church. So whatever you say is one flesh regarding the union between a husband and wife. You have to make that parallel to the union between Christ and the church. Now if one flesh constitute sex, then what does it constitute when you have the relationship between Christ and the church? See, it's gotta, you've got to line the scriptures up. Whatever we say about one flesh in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, we have to apply to what? To Christ and the church. It's talking about the closeness, the unity that exists between the husband and wife. In fact, Jesus goes on in Matthew chapter 19, and He says, "...shall leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh." Somebody described that as leaving, cleaving, and weaving, coming together, and becoming one in purpose, and, and talking about unity. That's what he's talking about. Then he goes on. Wherefore, there are no more one, twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So that's the way it's supposed to be. One man, one woman for life, and they are joined by God. There's a lot of people that actually believe, even in the Lord's church, that God has nothing to do with this union between the husband and the wife. That he does no joining. But that's not the case. God joins them. Then, of course, they ask the follow-up question. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? So Jesus then responds, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffers you to put away your wife. But from the beginning, again, it was not so. Because divorce had become such a problem in Israel, God regulated it. But He never intended for that to be the case. One man, one woman for life. And then we go over to Romans chapter 7, our second verse that we're going to look at. And by the way, we could, we could really look at a lot of other verses, but I think these two lay out the, the principles that we're going to be talking about. And, uh, you know, we could look at Matthew 5.32, Mark chapter 10, and we're going to look, look at Mark 6 in just a minute. But there's other verses we could look at that would kind of uh, help bring it together even more than what we're doing, but this is sufficient for what we're, our purpose is. Notice, beginning in verse 1, Know ye not... Brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. And so he's going to teach them something about the law, just as, he, as Paul did back in Ephesians, teaching something about the church. And he's going to use the principle of marriage to teach this. And then here's the principle. Chapter, verse 2, he says, For the woman... Uh, has a husband uh, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. So the law, God's marriage law, is intended to be one man, one woman for life. But he says, if the husband, what, be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. The marriage union 
ends at death. That's what it's talking about. So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no longer an adulteress, though she be married to another man. So we have the, the principle, one man, one woman, for life, but then, see so that's the general marriage law, one man, one woman for life. And then in verse 9, Jesus says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except for fornication. There's the exception. The force of an exception is, is this. If and only if, in the case of, of what? Fornication. That's the only reason acceptable for God to end a marriage other than the death of a spouse. He said, except, for forn except to be for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery, and whosoever marries her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. I was trying to discuss this with Brian Braswell one time, and I asked Brian, Brian was a good friend of mine, I don't bear him any ill will, uh, other than the fact that he's turned from the truth, uh, I was trying to discuss this with Brian, and I asked him, I said, are all marriages equal? Are all marriages equal? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, well, let me see if I can work this thing. Let's look at our chart. Well, think about it. Remember, marriage is between a man and a woman, and here's the direct relationship. Remember, they shall become one flesh. There is a direct relationship between the husband and the wife. Such passages as Romans chapter 13 indicate that we need to obey civil law regarding the union between a husband and a wife. As long as the civil law does not violate principles of God's law, then we are obligated to abide by civil law. And so whatever civil law says constitutes a marriage as long as it doesn't violate uh, God's law. Whenever the couple complies with civil law, they're married in this sense. That's their direct relationship. Okay, everybody would probably agree with that. You know, back I've, I've, I've read of some customs, they would jump the broom and that would indicate marriage, Right? They would they tie the knot, some people would say. Uh, Texas has a law nowadays that if a couple wants to represent themselves as husband and wife by opening a joint bank account, uh, that that can be uh, a constitute marriage, and they would be married in that sense. Since that doesn't violate God's law, I would say that if they comply to, with the civil law on that matter, then they're just as married as if somebody had a church wedding. Okay, because that doesn't violate any principles of God's law. But we need to recognize that we are married and joined by God. Here's the indirect. When man, when the man complies with God's law and the woman complies with God's law, then we have the indirect union made by God. That's his joining them together. Marriage is scriptural and legal when it's in compliance with God's law and civil law. Now, over here we see marriage is not scriptural until the couple is in compliance with all three relationships. Now, this is really the basic principle that the Bible lays out for marriage right here. Notice on one side we have a man. What if we put a woman, over, uh, a man over here? Can we put a man over here? And, and now civil law will let you do that, right? Civil law will say yes. We had one uh, first one in Texas. Somebody said just the other day. We can have a, a, a what if we put a woman over here and a woman over here? Civil law says you can do that all you want, and civil law says that's marriage. Now again I ask, are all marriages equal? 
Is a marriage between a man and a man the same as what we have represented on this chart? No. It's different. If we put a, a man and a man here, they may be joined by civil law, but God hasn't ever joined that marriage together. God condemns that in the Scriptures repeatedly. We have a woman marrying a woman or, or a woman marrying herself or, yeah, put Jane Doe marrying Jane Doe. How about that? The woman marry, put the Eiffel Tower over there. Does that, does that meet all the requirements? Are they, would that be in, in compliance with, with all three relationships? The man and the woman and the man with God and the woman with God, would that be in compliance with all those? No, absolutely not. When I was first assigned this topic, I got on the Internet and started looking. In fact, I, I read something, uh, Yahoo come up with a news item, and it said that a woman was marrying her cat. She married her cat, and lo and behold, there's a whole website devoted to people marrying their pets. You, you, they even had a marriage license. Can you imagine that? Does that sound anything like what we have here? No. But yet, if we, if we say all you have to do is comply with civil law, then anything goes that man can come up with. But the fact is, God regulates marriage. And until God joins that marriage together, when it's in compliance with His law and civil law, then He joins it together. Until that happens, you don't have a marriage in the true scriptural sense of the word. Now we understand that when we're talking about marriage, or at least most people will, that are members of the Lord's church. They will accept what we've said so far, for the most part. Alright, now... What if we have a marriage that is scriptural and legal? Now, now again, we have a marriage is scriptural and legal when in compliance with only civil law. It's unscriptural when it's only civil law. This union recognizes the relationship between the man and the woman only. Suppose one of them is uh, put away for fornication. One of us has been unscripturally divorced. Either way, the Bible says, according to Jesus, Matthew 19 and verse 9, except somebody put away a spouse for fornication, if they remarry, what's the result? Adultery. So you have someone that has a right, according to civil law, to marry, but they don't have a right according to the Scriptures. A man puts away his wife for fornication and she marries another. In what sense is she married? Is she married in the sense that we talked about here? Remember, people that are eligible to be married are those, a man a marrying a woman, when both of them have either never been married or they've been married and their spouse died. Or they've been married and they put away their spouse for fornication. Those are the people that have the eligibility to marry. But you come over here and say one of them has been put away for fornication. They don't have a right to marry. Not according to God. You see, they're not respecting the relationship between the man and God or the woman and God. They're ignoring that indirect relationship. They might come over here in civil law. They might abide in civil law and have that union uh, at the courthouse. Have some justice of the peace say, yes, you're married. Civil law allows for that. They don't recognize the scriptural qualifications for the candidates. They don't even recognize anymore that it has to be a man and a woman. So suppose we, we, we change this to a man over here. We can get a civil marriage. But we're never going to be joined by God. I mean, is that easy to understand? It is to me. I'm hoping I'm conveying what the Bible says here. Because it's pretty simple. 
We have to comply with man's law and God's law or we're not joined in the scriptural sense. And if we're not joined in the scriptural sense, the result is sin. You're either living in fornication or adultery. That's, that's just the, 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 the long and short of it. Now, we think, go further with this. Let's go further with this. Let's look at divorce. Let's look at divorce. If you will agree that a man is not joined to a woman unless they're in, in compliance with civil law and God's law, then what about divorce? Would not the same hold for divorce? That I'm not divorced until I comply with civil law and God's law? Would that not be the same uh, situation? You know, I can go to civil law and I can get a divorce for just about anything. No contest. I, I can probably, in some courts, get a, a, a divorce without the consent of my spouse. That's how loose the court system has become or, 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 or gotten on the area of divorce. No fault divorce, divorce for any cause. You know, if you ask some, some uh, judge today, uh, is it right to divorce for any cause? What do you think he would say? Do you think he would say like Jesus, have you not read? No. Absolutely not. He's going to say, of course it's right to divorce for any cause. In fact, you don't even have to show cause anymore. You know, back when I was a, a lot younger, uh, I remember a time, remember I'm older than 50, so I remember these days. Uh, I remember a time when a judge had the right to deny a divorce if you didn't have sufficient cause. And that's, that's the correct position as long as you understand what sufficient cause is. But we've, again, our society has, has degraded marriage to the point that, oh well, that one didn't work out, I'll try again. Just kick the, the wife burns the toast, right? Just kick her out, go get another wife that doesn't burn the toast. But when we think about divorce, scriptural, it has to be scriptural and legal. Alright, divorce is scriptural and legal when in compliance with God's law and civil law. In what situation will God allow divorce scripturally? For any cause? No. God intends marriage to, between, to be between one man, one woman for life, and the only exception is what? Fornication. That's the only legitimate scriptural cause for divorce. Now suppose someone goes, comes along, right, and they don't have that cause. They don't have that cause. Divorce is not scriptural until couples are in compliance with all three relationships. See, again, it, can it get any simpler than that? You've got to comply with civil law. Remember, as long as civil law doesn't contradict God's law, then you comply with it. If somebody has a scriptural right for divorce, their mate... Uh, commits fornication, they're still bound to, uh, by God's law to follow whatever civil law requires to be divorced. And so again, we have the, the indirect relationship through God when we're in compliance with that. We have the direct relationship between civil law. We're in compliance with that. Then God separates the union. Remember that union He made when you're married? Let not man put us under. Only God can, can put us under a marriage that He joined. Now we can go through civil law and we can, we can break this direct union here. But we're not breaking this direct union there. We're still bound by God's law on divorce. Now there are consequences if we get a, a civil divorce but we don't get a scriptural divorce. 
If you put away your spouse for other than fornication, and then you want to go contract a marriage with somebody else, there's consequences. If a spouse is put away for fornication and they go contract another marriage, then there, what? There's consequences for that too. Now let's look at this from another standpoint in Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6 and verse 16, But when Herod heard thereof, he said it is, John, whom I beheaded, he is risen from the dead. See, he mistook what was going on. Now verse 17, for Herod himself, what did he do? Had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. Whose wife was Herodias? Herodias was Herod's brother's wife. And he had John bound because of her. Now notice what it says. For he had what? He had married her. Now wait a minute. I thought that Herodias was Philip's wife. Now if that's the case, if that's Philip's wife, how could Herod marry her? How could he be married to her? You begin to see that all marriages are not equal? Is that right? This man was married to his brother's wife. How could he have done that? Now notice verse 18. For John had said unto Herod, It's not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Wait a minute. I thought he said he married her. He married her. How could he be married to his brother's wife? And if it's not lawful for him to have her, what law had he violated? Well, here's what's going on. Remember, in order for divorce to be approved of God, it has to be legal and scriptural. What Herod had done, he had legally, through civil law, married his brother's wife. Implied in that is they were divorced. They were divorced according to civil law. And so now Herod comes along and says, I'll marry her. John says, wait a minute, it's not lawful for you to have her. Well, according to civil law it was. Right? Right? Civil law, you can divorce for any cause, be married however many times you want, to whomever you want, and sometimes even to whatever you want. And that's civil law. So what law did he violate? It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And by the way, in what sense was he married to her? What sense was he married to that woman who is considered his brother Philip's wife? Right here. He certainly wasn't married according to God's will. Because that's the law that John said he violated. It's not lawful. We would say scriptural. It's not lawful for you to have her. And so divorce, of course, has to comply with man's law as long as it doesn't contradict God's law. But it also, in order for it to be scriptural and approved by God, it has to comply to His rules as well. Again, I'm hoping I'm making this overly simple. Because it's really not that hard. I remember hearing somebody was in an open forum and and, and the guy got up and said, Would you explain Matthew 19 verse 9? And whoever's doing open forum uh, just read the verse. And the guy was still at the microphone that asked him to explain the verse. No, no, I'd like for you to comment on that verse and explain it. So he just read it again. And the guy says, no, 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 no. maybe you don't understand. I would like for you to tell us what that means. And finally, the guy doing the open forum said, you know, this verse isn't hard to understand. But it's sometimes hard to do. Okay? 
Some, this, I, I really don't think this needs a lot of explanation because I think it's pretty simple. Now, let's look here. Marriage, termination, without God's approval. Civil law, whoop, went too far. Civil law only. They break the civil union, the direct relationship between the husband and wife, but the scriptural union is still bound by God's law. See, that's the situation that people get in when they divorce for other than fornication. You can go to the courts, I want to get a divorce. And we just, we're just incompatible. We just can't get along. I don't like her anymore. Uh, she burns the toast. Or, or really, that you don't even have to give a reason. All you have to do is say, I want a divorce. Okay, here's your divorce. So that's what's going on here. doesn't have anything to do with fidelity or infidelity or anything. That's what's going on. Other than fornication. And so the physical union is broken by civil law, but they're still bound by the spiritual union of God's law. Again, you're not divorced until God says you're divorced. Alright? So, again, I think, I hope, making it simple. How much time do I got? Five and a half? Okay. I might make it. So, now let's look at termination at death. Here's where marriage ends with God's approval. Okay? Here, let's just say we'll pick on the woman. The woman dies. Okay? Now, that severs her indirect relationship. She's met the qualification here of God's law. Remember, the woman married until death. Bound to the husband until death. But what, what happens after death? Unions broke. You're free to marry whomever you will as long as they're qualified to marry. Keep that in mind. And so that also severs, death severs the direct relationship. And civil law recognizes that as well. So we're in compliance with civil law. We're in compliance with spiritual law. Death dissolves both physical and spiritual relationship. Now, this is getting complicated, right? Not really. Now let's look at Termination for fornication. Marriage ends with God's approval. Woman puts away her husband for his fornication. Okay, she's in compliance with God's law. Right? She goes and gets a civil divorce. She's in compliance with man's law. Right? Then what about this guy over here? If he marries, what happens? Adultery. See, he's still bound. He's still bound by God's law. And God's law says if you're put away, if you're put away for fornication, then you give up the right to marry. Is God serious about His marriage law that He puts such a restriction on it? About who can marry, who can divorce, and out of the divorce, who can remarry? Yeah, see here? Civil law only. He can go out. This, this fornicator, the man that's put away for fornication, he can go out according to civil law and he can get another marriage, a direct relationship, right? Physical relationship. But there's no recognized spiritual relationship between this man and this woman. Because God doesn't allow this man the right to remarry. That's, that's how simple this issue really is. That's how simple it is. I could go back and we could look at a lot of things about how people try to get around this. Bell's doctrine. Well, you know, man's not under uh, uh, that marriage law until he becomes a Christian. Not under the law of Christ in general. If that's the case, how could you ever become a sinner? Sin's transgression of the law. If you're not under the law, how can you become a sinner? And once you become a sinner, if you're not under the law until you become a Christian, how do you become a Christian? So there's all kinds of problems. But what did Jesus say? Whosoever. And when He said whosoever, He went back all the way to the beginning. This is universal. It's not limited by time or circumstance. This is God's universal law that started with the very first marriage. 
We could go on and on and talk about other things. What about the timing? Well, let's go back over here. And uh, let's say uh, this man wants to get a divorce, but this good Christian woman says, no, we don't have a right to get a divorce. We don't have a scriptural right to get a divorce. And the man persists and says, I'm going to get a divorce anyway. And so he puts her away. Are they still joined by God? Yes. Because they haven't followed His law on divorce, except for fornication. And this woman says, I don't recognize that, that, uh, that divorce. I consider that we're still married by God because we were joined by God and until... God separates so He puts that union asunder. We're married. Now what happens later if this man finds him another woman and he wants to contract another marriage? Once that happens, he's now, what? Put himself in a position of fornication because God, remember, that's still, according to God, his wife. Now here's the issue that's come up most recently, does this woman have a right to marry? I believe she does. Because when this man contracts another marriage, he's now violated God's marriage law, and this woman, who's remained faithful, is now in a position to put him away. According to God's law, God will sever that union, and she can remarry now, there's a lot of controversy over that, but that's the way I understand it. And the, and the fact of the matter is, they're not divorced until God says so. And as long as she's trying to comply with God's law and remain faithful to this man, even though he's separated and contracted a civil divorce, some people will say, well, that's the waiting game. You're just waiting for one of them to mess up. No, it's not. It's not the waiting game. She has no intent of waiting for this man. She wants, she wants him back, wants her husband. But he won't have any of it. Again, I believe it's pretty simple. If you have any questions, I'll be available after the lectures. Appreciate your time. Enjoy your freedom. Bruce, we appreciate those comments uh, very much.